Great, we are live. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Oh wait, your screen, no. No, okay, let me try this again. I see you. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the NAC meeting today, March 18. And um, I'll go ahead and share the um, agenda here. And the first thing that we do is we uh, go ahead and start with our land acknowledgement and introductions. And then we'll start and turn it over to Chairwoman Kimberly after that. Uh, Cheryl, may I ask that you um, bless us with the land acknowledgement, please. Good evening, everyone. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on Dena'ina land. They have lived, hunted, and gathered within the Cook region for thousands of years. We thank them for their stewardship of the land, air, water, and all that sustains us within their traditional lands. And we will strive to be good neighbors. Leanna Cheryl. Oops. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go down the line of introductions, starting with Kimberly. Hello, I'm Kazakwa or Kimberly Santacata. Um, I'm half Nubat. We have three girls currently attending Anchorage School District at Polaris that are quarter Nubat, and our youngest will be in kindergarten this fall. We filled out the lottery for her, and she's attending Cook and Native Head Start this year. Welcome, okay, Shannon. Is she here? Tonya? Janach? Hi. So my name is Tanya Jimmy and I have a junior high student and I apologize. I'm just going to be keeping it short. I'm Everyone's got a Zoom thing going on, so I'm down in the, the dining room area. So, all right, Guyana. Son. Oh. Shanda. Hi, I'm Shanda Losi. I am Standing Rock, Lakota, and I have a fourth grade daughter at Rogers Park in the Highly Gifted program. Guyana Macon. Hi there, my name is Megan Sherman. My Inupac name is Egona. My family is from Kotsky. I have three children in the district, a second grader and third grader at Bowman and an eighth grader at Hanshu. Great, thank you. Is Jocelyn here? I don't see her. Um, Angela. Not present. Nishay. Uh, my name is Kavak Sivalukti. Uh, my English name is Nishay Time Andrew. I am 18 years old and a senior at Service High School. Ayana Nishay, uh, Elena. Hi there. Uh, I'm Elena. I'm a UPIC senior at. Oh, Elena, I think we just lost your um, sound. Hello, can you hear me? I, I didn't. Um, I didn't hear what school you were at. I think that's when the sound cut out. Oh, I go to Service High. Okay, thank you, Brian. I am uh, Brian McIntyre. I'm a teacher at William Tice Elementary. I have two students that went to uh, uh, East High School, Clark Middle School, Randall Middle School, and Tyson Elementary. And they've graduated now, and one's in college, and well, they're both in college. One's just taking a year off. Okay, thank you, Brian. I, um, I, it was hard to hear you. I don't know if the volume was all the way up. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, Georgiana? Hi, my name is um, Georgiana Chikirakstar. I am a fourth grade teacher at Alaska Native Cultural Charter School. We have had our um, first few days of face-to-face -face 
And um, it's been exhausting. It's been exhilarating. And we're really ga- uh, glad to have the kids back in school. Um, I have uh, a son who graduated from East High School and we're at East High School. So things are looking different this year. Leanna Georgiana, Ricky. Oh, thank you. Uh, Ricky Lind, um, Golachuk is my Yupik name. I teach music at Winterberry and Rilke Shula. I'm also, uh, this is new, I am a Ed Rising teacher leader, which means if you're a middle or high school student interested in entering the education field, whether it be a teacher or something else, uh, you could reach out to me, which is neat. And I like the closed captioning. This is cool. Boogily boogily. Diana Ricky, Senior Director Doreen. Hi, good evening. Um, my Yupik name is Agafia. My family, my mom's family is originally from Napamu on the Cuscoquim, and my father is originally from Cedar Rowley, Washington. I am the Senior Director, but most importantly, you can see behind their old pictures. I'm a mom. I have a 25-year-old son, and I have a 14-year-old that's attending Romig. Um, I just want to take this minute real quick and give a shout out to Megan, because she's fierce and she's been at it for uh, um, two hours already and she's got another two hours to go just advocating for our kids. She was on our DIMSI, what we call the DIMSI committee and it's the District Instructional Materials and Curriculum Committee and we're looking at the process of how the district adopts curriculum and long-term short-term goals and thank you Megan for um, representing us and and, um, staying with us for another two hours tonight. Thank you. Diana, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Can you hear me better now? Um, just a tad, but not too much. It's, you're, it's almost like you're muted. I'll keep working out. Okay, great. Um, before we get to the rest of the title six staff, I see that Sher- um, Shannon and Angela are here. Can you introduce yourselves, please? Uh, Wanga Ayayarak. I'm Shannon Hawkins. Uh parents uh, member and uh wanga ajwana hi i'm angela and look bornelli <coughs> i'm a senior at service and my family from gnome wales and little Diamond. glad to be here tonight well yeah thank you uh and i'm from bethel and i'm supervisor for indian education um and almost to a year, <laughs> a very long year. In COVID years, it's like, you know, five years. So, all right, uh, Julianne. Hi, I'm Julianne Bourdon. I'm the administrative assistant for Title VI. Um, my family is from Ohio and Florida. My husband's family is from Wales. And um, my son grew up in Nome up until fourth grade till he moved here. And he's playing hockey down in Bozeman, Montana right now. Thank you, Cheryl. Hello, everyone. My name is Cheryl Sherman. I'm the cultural enrichment specialist for Title VI Indian Education. I am an ASD graduate, and I have five students in the district currently. I have I also have a senior who graduated last year. I have another senior this year. I have an eighth grader, a sixth grader, a fifth grader, and a first grader at College Gate in the Yupik Immersion Program. Thank you. Uh, Member Margot Bellamy. Yes, thank you. I'm Margot Bellamy. Uh, I'm currently a member of the Anchorage School Board, and I am delighted to be in this space. I usually watch um, the meetings after, uh, you know, after they're over online. So I'm really glad today to be in the room and to be able to um, have a have a very uh, um, thoughtful conversation regarding two new proposed policies. Um, but I've had, I have two kids. They're both graduates of ASD. And I have two grandsons who are currently in the ASD. So thank you. 
Thank you for being here today. Uh, both Quentin and Paula aren't in the queue yet. Um, I will be monitoring their attendance, so hopefully they'll be here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and I will turn it over then to um, Chairwoman uh, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, so um, we'll do a call to order for the March 18th Native Advisory Committee meeting um, on March 18th at 6 11 p.m. Juliana, can you, or I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Julianne, can you please do a roll call for us? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Shannon? Here. Tanya? Here. Shanda? Here. Kimberly? Here. Megan? Here. Jocelyn? Angela? Here. Nishae? Here. Elena? Here. Brian? Here. Ricky? Here. Georgiana? Here. Okay. We have a quorum. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve our agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda. Angela makes a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. This is Shanda. This is Kimberly. Is there any discussion at all on the agenda? Seeing and hearing none, I will call the item to a vote. All those that are, um, oh, I lost the word, that accept the agenda as it is, please vote now. Aye. 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 Any opposed? We will accept the agenda as it is written. Um, can I entertain a um, motion to approve the minutes of February 18th NAC meeting? Shannon makes a motion to approve February 18 uh, meeting minutes. This is Tanya, I second that. Is there any discussion? I will call the vote for um, the approval of the minutes of the February 18th meeting. Um, all those that are in agreement, please vote now. Aye. 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 Bye. Any opposed? And seeing that that was passed, we will move on to graduation regalia update with a resolution and I will turn it over to Nishay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so for those of you who have been a part of the NAC um, since um, our regalia journey started, um, to give insight, I joined when I was 15 as a sophomore, which is kind of crazy because now I'm 18 as a senior. And I joined with the intent to see what I could do um, to encourage the ASD school board to pass a policy that would allow students to wear their regalia. Um, I did this in hopes that I could wear my traditional UPIC headdress uh, during graduation. Um, as per last meeting um, from this discussion, I contacted Dr. Kirsten Johnson and Mr. Marty Lang, which are the director of secondary schools and the director of high schools respectively. And they encouraged me to go through the amazing committee who stewarded this in the beginning um, to expand this policy. So here we have um, the resolution that I drafted up. 
um, to expand the adjudicated report 5127B graduation regalia to include tribal headwear. Um, because the current um, adjudicated report um, currently says that a um, item of cultural significance cannot replace the Muda board, which um, does inhibit the ability to wear my Yupik headdress. Um, so I will just go ahead and read this. Um, so, whereas the Anchorage School District's Native Advisory Committee wishes to expand the original adjudicated report 5217B graduation regalia on the account of the original intent of such progress. And whereas Title VI Indian education, in order to be more inclusive in honoring traditional tribal identities in the Anchorage School District, and whereas as part of the mission to encourage, inspire, and strengthen solidarity, solidarity among students' cultural heritage and education, and whereas in order to maintain high school graduation ceremony decorum and tradition while honoring the immense diversity uh, in the Anchorage School District, and let it there be, therefore be resolved that tribal headwear traditional to Alaska Native and Native American identities may replace the motor board graduation cap, and be it further resolved of which will be determined by the appropriate staff of the Title VI Indian Education Department. And be it further resolved, the preceding details are officially addendum to the adjudicated report 5217B. And be it further resolved, Superintendent Dr. Dina Bishop and school board members Andy Holman, Dina Mitchell, Alyssa Vakelis, Dave Donnelly, Ms. Margot Bellamy, Star Marset, and Alicia Hild confirm the preceding details. Um, so now I would like to welcome uh, discussion regarding this. Um, any questions or points of detail that anyone would like to add to this? Um, or if there's anything that was confusing that could be clarified um, so it can be officially resolved. Hi, this is Doreen. Nishé, I want to say thank you. You did an amazing job. And the thank you. I, I teared up because I'm just so proud of you. And I'm proud of the committee. And um, good job. Uh, the, the part that I really appreciate is all of it. But I, I really appreciate the wording, the tribal head, headwear traditional to Alaska Native and Native American identities. Good way of pointing that out. Good way of um, kind of making it narrow, because I know that that was something that um, as administrators, we had a hard time um, talking about and how do we how do we do it in a respectful way. So thank you. That was a good job. Thank you so much, Ms. Doreen. That means a lot to a lot coming from you. <laughs> Nishé, you did a wonderful job. It's beautifully written. I am so proud that I am on this board and that I can even be remotely associated with this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's wonderful. I just want to make sure that the way it's written, if there was um, uh, a negation, um, it would still be sent, be able to be sent to the committee to be approved, like all the other regalia, correct? Um, yes. So I, um, I put on the second resolve uh, point, uh, of which will be determined by the appropriate staff of Title VI Indian Education. Um, I really was kind of intentional with that one because although I love the principles of the ASD, I really think this is best um, and most appropriately decided by our staff. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure that if a principal were to say this is not fitting that there was somebody that would be able to give a second opinion. Thank you. You brought up a good point. So it's not written anywhere. I just want to rem or let you know when we did this, not last year, but the year before, um, we met as principal or the principals met and we went through all of the notifications 
Um, and if there, there needed to be clarification or there were some um, questions about um, the notifications, then the principals would follow up. I really appreciated that opportunity because I think it really actually was a great learning opportunity to learn more about the diversity within our district. So, and, and just to let you know, I was there as well. Um, and if we needed to bring in experts, um, cultural, cultural knowledge bearers, then we would do that as well. Okay, um, so that makes me think, should um, a part of the, uh, the resolved portion, should any of that include um, how it should be selected? Should I mention it should be selected as um, the, the current adjudicated report? Hello, this is Tanya, and I just want to say um, that I'm I'm very much so proud. And like Doreen, I, I choked up too, because when my daughter graduated, that's when I first learned you couldn't wear regalia. And so um, I'm so excited. Um, <clears throat> very beautifully written. And I was wondering, you know, because as you know, we're, we're having this discussion and dialogue, I was wondering if the um, be it re further resolved, if we can say current administration, because the school board, you know, I don't know, you know, will, you know, change eventually. So, but if we can have like current school board, current superintendent, um, then that way, you know, um, that was just a thought. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out, but thank yeah. you. Oh yeah, no. Um, thank you for your kind remarks, and um, I think I will definitely relook at that because that is um, election time. So thank you for reminding me. Shay, I am so happy that this is together, and I really hope that this is able to go through for this school year. Uh, to hopefully see some service graduates wearing more traditional regalia. So I appreciate uh, you bringing this to uh, NAC today, and I'm really excited to see what the next steps are. Great job. Thank you so much. Um, Crystalline, is there anything I should add or touch on um, in regards to this discussion? Um, well, if you wanted to uh, make, you know, this is, if this is a draft, I would recommend that um, uh, probably within the next week, um, maybe there is a subcommittee, that's just my proposal, just to make sure that uh, the language and considerations um, would be, um, you know, altered for the next meeting. So it's up to um, the board to determine what the next steps are. Definitely. So if there's um, anyone out there who would like to um, kind of go with this editorial process, I will be making some changes. I think I will be adding the selection process that it will be the same as the current policy. Um, but as all as well as change the language from the bottom uh, resolved lines to current administration. Um, so if anyone feels so inclined to make a motion to do a subcommittee, um, I believe that would be welcomed right now. I will motion to make a subcommittee to work on um, the final draft to be brought to the next NAC monthly meeting and going forward to the school district after that. Angela seconds the motion. Oh, um, all those in favor say aye. Can I ask a question before we vote? Uh, yes. So this is Shanda. If we bring it back, and I, I don't know who can answer this question, but is that going to be enough time for this to be ready for graduation? Um, 
graduation, as far as I know, is within the first few weeks of May. Um, and the notification deadline, if I'm correct, is April 1st um, or somewhere in the beginning of April. Um, from what I understood with my discussion with um, Dr. Kirsten and Mr. Lang is as of now, we are going through the process with the, um, the current um, policy as they're taking it um, kind of just as a case by case um, notification. Um, if um, Ms. Brown or Ms. Scott could touch on that, um, clarify. Um, as far as I understand, that's uh, the process for this year. That's correct. So um, when I, I don't think they're really, they're doing it case by case. So again, when they give the notification, if we see headdresses, headdresses um, the principals and Dr. Kirsten and um, Marty Lang will approve mm -hmm. this year. And but I think um, just making sure that we're changing policy, I think um, we shoot for that. Um, for anyone who um, wants to wear tribal headwear this year, I encourage you to talk to your principals um, because they are a big factor in deciding um, and they would know you personally if you reached out to them and when it comes time to decide um, maybe uh, they're able to give some allowances, um, considering that this policy is in progress during a sensitive time for graduation. Thank you. And you can always reach out to our office as well, 742-4445, um, or you can email uh, brown underscore, and I'll put it in the chat as well. I think we have chat. Nope, don't. So. Oh figure that out, how to get that information. Um, contact Indian Education, Title VI Indian Education through our website. And all our emails are linked there. So if anyone has any issues, we'll be happy to help you with that. And I do want to make a point of clarification. Um, the regalia deadline is April 15, and the next NAC meeting is April 15. Um. Okay, that is important to know. And um, so the subcommittee meeting will have to be between um, anywhere tomorrow and before April 15th. And um, who um, should I talk with you, Ms. Scott or Ms. Brown, about um, organizing that? Um, Point of clarification, let's vote it first. Yes, okay. Um, so we had a motion and a second. So all those in favor of a, sub, a subcommittee group to clarify um, the resolution for graduation regalia, please say aye. 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 And those opposed? Oh, this is Ricky and I'm opposed, but I'm only an advisory vote. Ricky, can you repeat that? I think he said he's opposed, but he is an advisory vote. Um, I think that's what I caught. Um, so would this mean that we would move, uh, move forward with the subcommittee since it was a majority? Okay, so we will move forward with creating a subcommittee to review um, the updated draft of uh, graduation regalia resolution. And, I, and I'll be happy to join that subcommittee. Um, I can help organize it if you'd like sooner than later. And then um, meanwhile, behind the scenes, looking at the process as well. Okay. Or the school board and what all the other details. Definitely. All right, well, um, Seeing as we will be moving forward with this, um, I have to conclude my my portion of today. Um, I do have to go to a, another Zoom meeting, unfortunately. If I can slip away <laughs> earlier, I will definitely do so. Um, but I can never express how much I, I appreciate this group. I'm so glad I joined when I did when I was so young. I really opened my eyes to what I wanna do in the future and it opened up so many opportunities for me and um, to just see the growth of what this committee was from when I was 
only 15 and now I'm 18 and we're still expanding this policy, which is, I think, very awesome. So thank you all for your time and your consideration and your comments. Well, Yana and Ashe, um, we'll definitely keep in touch NAC board. You'll see an email out and we'll be happy to help schedule that for you. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you, Nache. You're fabulous. You should stay and do my report. Do my do my discussion. Oh, no, I'm I'm shaking enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Bye, everyone. This is Kimberly. Moving on with our agenda. Our next point is the Anchorage School District update, um, board update by Miss Margot Bellamy. Thank you. Wow, uh, Nache just blew me out of the water here. Uh, I got to regroup. <laughs> anyway, but thank you guys for uh, making time for me. Um, the board is uh, uh, has set forth two proposed policies. One is an instructional equity policy, and I'm hoping that you guys have copies. If not, I can uh, share my screen and put them up in just a minute. But one is an instructional equi equity policy and the other is an anti-racism policy. And uh, both policies uh, grew out of um, our strategic planning process, which began back in 2019. Some of you in the, in the room were at some of those community forums. We held several community forums around our strategic plan. And what came up in, uh, what came up in those discussions had to do about our goals, which is a vision for education in our community, as well as our values. And the values are those, are, are those uh, um, the things that we call guardrails right now. And so in turn, so we had to, uh, um, in, in 2019, we had laid all the groundwork. We did all, all of our discussion. We were supposed to adopt our goals and guardrails in 2020 so that we can move on to our, uh, to, to, you know, to the next piece, which would be what are the policies, what policies are missing so that we can effectively implement our goals and guardrails. Then COVID hit, so we had to put it off and then we brought it back and we just adopted our goals and guardrails uh, last December. And I know that you guys have had some discussion on the goals and guardrails. Um, so um, in order for one of the things, there are a couple of things, uh, thoughts that um, came forward uh, on, my, on the board as to what was missing from our policies. We currently have, um, you know, uh, you know, we, we don't have, an, we, we have our curriculum and adoption policies. We don't have a policy that speaks to, um, uh, you know, equity. And a lot of what came out of the discussions, the community discussions, had to do with equity. Yes, it was reading. Yes, it was math. And yes, it was a life and career, life, college, and career readiness. But it, there were also things like underrepresentation in certain programs in our schools, uh, identifying and eliminating barriers, barriers that that um, that would keep some of our kids from being successful. So, uh, and that kind of led to looking at our data, which we already knew what our data looks like. You guys know what it looks like. It looks, if you look at our data, you will see that some of our kids are, are being more successful than others. And, and the ones who are not being successful are our black, brown, and indigenous kids. And so in looking at how can we systemically change and, 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 and hold ourselves accountable for uh, making sure that we are giving every kid the opportunity to be the access and the opportunity to be successful. So that's how I came to member um, Mitchell and I kind of initiated the, the work around this. And then the whole board came together to show, to, to, uh, rep, to um, uh, come up with the policies that we have now. So before I begin, what I'd like to do is just go through some definitions. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen really quickly and then figure out where my PowerPoint is. There it is. 
And then I need to go to share this slideshow. Because I, I think it's it's important to start with definitions so that we um so that we're on the same, uh, at least we're we're kind of at least on, on the same uh, in the same space with what what these policies are and what they're not. Okay, why am okay? I better use this one here. Okay, so when it comes to um, there's a lot of talk about what's equitable uh, in what's equitable and what is equal. Our current system is based on equality. It's based on giving everybody the same. And so when you look at our data, what, what, what really comes up, what really pops out is that yes, we, we do a great job of giving every kid uh, the opportunity to do whatever. But we don't always look at, we have not always uh, considered what are the barriers, limitations that some kids face. So. Even though we are equally protected under the law when it comes to discrimination, harassment, bullying, and all those things that are illegal uh, uh, or legal protections for us in the workplace and in our classrooms, uh, we can no longer assume that, ev that e equality is the only way that we can uh, um, uh, provide for successful outcomes for all of our kids. So that's what, and that little diagram uh, shows you what equality really looks like. They all have the same box. They're standing on the same box. The taller kid, he can see pretty well. The kid in the middle, he can see pretty well. But look at the little guy in the blue shirt. Now he might be peeking through the little cracks in the fence, but the, you know, so equality, we have to go deeper. We can't just stop at providing uh, uh, just an, e you know, everything equal. So then comes in the term of equity and the board spent probably three sessions just working on this definition of equity. Uh, equity, and, and I'm going to read it verbatim, and, it, 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 and we actually start the actual policy with this term. Equity is the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have presented the, uh, prevented the full participation of some groups. Improving equity involves increasing justice and fairness within the procedures and processes of institutions or systems, as well as in their distribution of resources. And so when we give the same resources and we give, so this, these, these two slides represent the possibility, the possibilities of equity. You now have the kid to the left. He's tall enough. He doesn't need to have that box, but he's still able to enjoy that game. The kid in the middle is still on his box because if he didn't have it, he would not be able to see the game. And then the little guy in the blue shirt, well, hey, some... The, the, the kid, you know, he, he, he now has what he needs to enjoy that opportunity, that access. And then when you really look at removing structural barriers, we come up with uh, ideas to, to really make adjustments so that all kids benefit. So then it's no longer about the kid in the blue shirt, the maroon shirt, or the light blue shirt. It's about all kids and their ability to access opportunities, programs, and uh, other things. So when it comes to anti-racism, um, th this, this is a very important definition because when we talk about race, uh, people go places in their own experience that may or may, that, 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 that defines what anti-racism is for them. For the purposes of our, of our policies, when we are trying, to, when we are looking to to be um, uh, uh, to, to identify we, the practice, it's a practice of identifying, challenging, and changing the value structures and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism. So we're not out there calling people racist. We're not insinuating that people are racist. We, in 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 terms of educating our kids, we have got to value those structures, behaviors and changes 
that are limiting them from being successful. So when you look at our data, you will see that our black and brown kids, whether you are looking at graduation rates, you're looking at who's identified for special education, you're looking at who, uh, who, who has access to our choice programs or our um, uh, uh, special programs or alternative programs, um, that it is very clear that, uh, as well as our uh, achievement scores. Uh, so we want all of our kids to be successful. So we've got to be intentional and mindful about looking at all of the reasons why our kids may are, are not being successful. How do we give our kids, all kids, what they need to be successful? And the disparities in our system right now are absolutely along the lines of race, and we cannot continue to ignore that. Uh, and then I just have a note here about the difference between, um, you know, we, we the proposed policies will not replace our current legal laws, and our current laws and policies that protect our kids and our employees from non-discrimination and anti-harassment. It will not these we will the our policies the policies that we are going to discuss tonight will work in conjunction with the non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies so i'm going to stop sharing and then i'm going to uh come back and i'm going to pull up the well i don't know which one it'll be whichever one comes up is what we'll talk about first um where did it go okay nope Hold on one minute. Oh, shoot. Can you guys see that? No? Do you guys see a policy on my screen, on my screen share? Not yet. Okay. All right. Let me try again. Sorry. I'm, I'm challenged. Hold on. Let me try one more time. I meant to get these out to you guys in advance. Member Bellamy, I do have a copy that was sent to me internally. Yes, that would, can I would you? be happy to share it with you. Thank yeah. you. Let's and start with the uh, instructional equity policy, if if we can. Okay. And and then I I want to like uh, be responsive to uh, to the group. Uh, their your questions, your comments, your concerns. Um. All right, so that that is the this is the uh, the the equity the instructional equity policy draft, and as I said, we start out with the equity uh, defining what equity is, so that we are all on the same page, and then that second paragraph, uh, and I'll read it just in case people are having might, might have a difficult uh, time reading it in, in terms of seeing it. Uh, the board believes that instructional equity involves increasing justice and fairness within the procedures, processes, and allocation of resources within the district and its systems. Our district has a collective responsibility to sustain a school community and learning environment that reflects these values. Recognizing the importance of accountability and transparency to our community, the superintendent shall submit an annual equity report to the board. This may be a compilation of data presented at board meetings as part of the board's goals and guardrail monitoring, measuring equity of both inputs and outcomes. So uh, again, the policy sets the direction and then the superintendent gets to go back, will we'll take the policy if it's approved and put in the administrative regulations those will be the actions by which the policy will be implemented. So um, it is not it is not the intent of the policy to be prescriptive in terms of this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. We will have input into the administrative regulations that will guide, for for instance, the allocation of resources in our district. Um, that will. Um, you know, uh, uh, um, make sure that we have in turn, you know, uh, like if you look at our guardrails right now, those guardrails are stated in a will not 
uh, pers uh, uh, per uh, perspective. The superintendent will not, um, let me just read a couple of them. The superintendent will not leave student groups underrepresented in lottery application based programs. That's an equity statement, but it, it gives the guidance to the superintendent and we've adopted these. This policy will support that. The superintendent will not operate without a diverse or culturally responsive workforce. Again, diverse or culturally responsive workforce. That's another equity piece. The superintendent will not allow unsatisfactory employee performance to go uh, unidentified or unaddressed. And the superintendent will not operate elementary schools without mental health services. So those are the values that came out of our, um, out of our community, uh, the work that we did with the community. So your thoughts, concerns? I see Brian's hand. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm wondering how how are they going to measure and take data regarding equity? I mean, what kind of things will they be looking for to see to measure? Yeah, so it will be everything, every every way that we measure what our kids know and are able to do. So it would be it would it would be achievements uh, scores. It will be graduation rates. It will be dropout rates. It will be grade distributions. It will be all of those things um, that that uh, that we that that mark success or failure for kids. So that that seems to me a, as the result of inequities, not not fixing the equity problem. Does that make sense? Um, if we're measuring the outcomes of of what's caused by inequities, we need to me we need to figure out ways to measure what we're doing to solve the problem, not um, the outcome. So we have a, there is an equity audit that is, the, the, the baseline for this will be the equity audit that the superintendent has already commissioned. It will come to us, I, 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 any, I, I'm, I'm not sure when, but I'm sure it will be um, at some point. So we will have, the board will have that as a basis for setting the, uh, uh, the ARs. Because it doesn't, right now it doesn't exist. Does that answer your question, Brian? A little bit. Okay. Other questions? Kim, Kim has a question. Yes, Kim. So in looking at our historic indigenous people, there's generational trauma in um, especially Alaska Natives and American Indians um, where school has not been a positive thing. Will there be um, a look on how community, how schools reach out to the families and to bring school to a more positive light for um, families? Because I know when you don't feel like you're welcome somewhere mm -hmm. as a child and wanting to interact with somebody for your children, it can be hard for families sometimes mm -hmm. to seek the help that they need. Yes. And, and yes, and I think when we get to the the uh, anti-racism policy, it speaks to building communities of uh, work and learning communities uh, that that value all of uh, all of our students and families and employees as well. But I absolutely um, I absolutely agree that comes up uh, the whole concept of how we communicate with, engage with the community. Uh, comes up quite a bit, uh, and and we need to. So we know that that is, um, and that's not just a race. That's not just a race, uh, an issue of race. Uh, but some of our some of our families are not comfortable coming to school, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know whether it's to a, a a parent conference or having to come because uh, uh, of for some other reason, and so. Uh, trying to figure out how do we build communities that are uh, culturally responsive, respectful, and engaging for all of our kids is 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 part of why we feel both policies they will they will um, complement each other, but they will also stand alone. Because uh, I think for me the equity the instructional instruction is going to be at the the core of 
of of of how we um you know of of how we how we how we in, uh, implement changes that will benefit all kids, especially those kids who are right now um you know they're they're just not benefiting from the they're not benefiting from the opportunities or the or or from education as well as others and so in trying to address the disparity give every kid what they need it's you know we've got to do something different than than just the you know the equal the the the, the whole concept of equal just giving people you know just well we gave it we did it and they didn't take advantage of it it's bigger than that So I think Kimberly, when we go to the next policy, I think you'll you'll see a reflection of your concern there. Okay, I see Georgiana's hand. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, for um, for one for drafting this um, policy, and I really do appreciate the thought that went into this to um, highlight the um, the inequalities that we see across the board. This is just a couple of things. Um, one. Um, you know, with this whole year of the pandemic, um, that really showcased and highlighted the um, the inequalities that we see across the board. And we know that our minority children were adversely affected more so um, with the pandemic, um, with a lot of with a lot of various reasons. So I think that you know the the board really has to look at um, specifically look at those inequalities that were so highlighted. Mm -hmm. in this pandemic year and we're not just talking you know socioeconomic we're right. looking at you know um you know just um data broadband data computer mm -hmm. access all these things that that um that have the disparities between um who was successful and then who was not yes. and i really do appreciate um you bringing up the um the whole idea of justice and fairness and that brings to mind what um, we're trying to implement and learn at our school, which is the whole um, the whole idea of restorative practices. And I know that a lot of different schools look at this in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really important when you have these policies um, to have a variety of toolkits um, available to help people along the process. You know, to make um, the the moving parts easy to digest and easy to understand. And, um, you know, and that also kind of falls along um, with um, teacher training. Mm -hmm. And I know that the university at their level has really looked at the teacher training and how to better inform, um, you know, pre-service staff on the necessity of being culturally um, sensitive, mm -hmm. um, understanding the diversity. Mm -hmm. um, because when the first Alaskans had that training with ASD those years ago, we had a lot of people who were very uncomfortable with that process of looking at race and equity from an Alaska Native perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, when you start looking at the, um, you know, at different various groups and how they're underrepresented in ASD, I know that there's a lot of moving parts in um, addressing these. And um, as a teacher who's in the first cohort of minority leadership, I'm beginning to understand like the bigger picture of, of these things that you're bringing up. And thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Georgiana. And, you know, I, uh, again, th th this is, this is, this is the value and attached to it. If it passes will be teacher training. It will be, uh, underrepresentation in special programs, diversity and recruitment and how we, and culturally responsiveness. All of those things will be part of the action items that, uh, that it, which, and it will be, and, and teacher training is a big piece. Not the only piece, it's just a piece. Because we are doing a lot of things right now. We are doing, um, I mean, and I think it's an opportunity for us to kind of bring a lot of things um, together instead of having them out in silos, because we do we are doing some of a lot of this work now, but it it is it is not being done consistently throughout the district, 
All right. So we're, we're, there's no way that we're saying that nothing is being done. It's just that it, it's not being done. And the uh, restorative justice comes up over and over and over again. And um, so, uh, yeah, I thank you for your comments and I am ca I captured all of your um, recommendations. Brian, we're back to you. I, I can't see everybody, Doreen. Uh, can Brian speak again? <laughs> Hold on, Brian. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm mute, back, Brian. I mm -hmm. can't hear you. I'm mute. You're, you're on yeah. mute. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I, I guess that's what I was looking for because when when I read it, I was like, well, they're acknowledging that there's inequity in our instruction, right? And we already know that, and I've known that for 20 years. There's yes. inequity there. And it felt like this was just an acknowledgement of that. But you're no. saying that if we acknowledge it, they're going to put it, policies into place to help that problem. And there's going to be trainings and there's going to be absolutely all of that. Okay. That's what I was looking absolutely. for. Absolutely. Yeah, it, because right now, Brian, what, what we have is we have uh, we have equity work being done in the district, but we also have some not being done, right? And so uh, this will, you know, if, if, if this policy will engage us systemically as a district, as, you know, whether, you know, our teachers, our administrators, our kids, our families. Um, and, and so uh, what that will look like I mean, what the act, actual action items will be. I know communication will be one of them. I know teacher training will be a, a, a one of them. Um, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, so, so it, it, I, I, I know what I would do, but I'm not the superintendent, right? But we get to, we get to work with the superintendent to bring up uh, uh, those, you know, to make sure that we uh, cover everything which is why it's so important to hear from various groups so that uh, if it's not in the ARs, you know, if, it, if, if, or if we miss something just in the policy, then we, we, we want to fix it uh, before we uh, vote on it. And we won't be voting on it until April 20th. So you've got time even after today uh, to uh, get information to me or to any board member. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. So not seeing any hands on this one. Let's go to the anti-racism policy. So this one uh, is this one kind of sets people off on uh, on different um, because of their experience. Uh, it it, it kind of brings up things, and I just want to be real clear that you know we're when we when we're referring to anti-racism. We're refer it, it, uh, we, we are defining it as the practice of identifying, challenging, and changing the values, structures, and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism, race hatred, bias, and the oppression of marginalized groups. Now, we know that there are legal protections, right? So we're not replacing those. This is in conjunction with those legal protections. The Anchorage School Board and Superintendent shall work to end the predictive value of race on students' academic success and access equal and access to equal opportunities. The board rejects all forms of racism. And we've never said that before. We've always been legally, we've always uh, adhered to the legal protections under the law. The board acknowledges that racism has historically existed in our educational systems and is often compounded by other forms of discrimination, including those protective, protective classes referred to in uh, board policy 0410, non-discrimination. The board recognizes the negative impact of racism on student learning and on lifelong socioeconomic opportunities, health, and well-being. The board will work with the superintendent to identify and redesign any racially inequitable policies and procedures that limit academic opportunities. The board and superintendent will work to champion a district culture that values and respects the diversity and life experiences of all stakeholders to support the district's mission, vision, core values, goals, guardrails, 
instruction uh, guard, and guardrails, sorry. Instruction should encourage critical thinking on the history of racism in Alaska, America, and around the world, and the current structural, explicit, and unconscious biases toward people of different races. So, um, so, so if it is our, it is my hope in, 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 in really, again, we've been working on this. We start, I started out with a draft probably 17 pages long. And that draft was just too comprehensive for anybody to, 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 to be able to understand, right? But I got everything in my head out. <laughs> and when we started talking as a board, uh, at, at first I had instructional equity and anti-racism combined into one. I am so glad they convinced me to separate them out into two different ones because I think they are both stronger uh, because of it. Um, so your qu any questions around, what are your thoughts on this policy? Hi, my name is Quentin Simeon. I work for New Student Services at UAA. Hi, Quentin. Thank you for this information. Um, I think it's a great policy. I think um, I was working with uh, a friend of mine who's got a student in Anchorage School District, and some of the curricula that um, my friend's student was being exposed to had racist ideologies and things like that that just didn't sit right with me. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in this policy that addresses curriculum or anything that's being taught in, in the schools? So, uh, so yes, I think so. I think, um, uh, you know, when we are, there there will be, uh, again, uh, I don't know how, if you heard the explanation about the policy and then the ARs. I fully expect there to be a, a curriculum and instruction AR that will be attached to not just the anti-racism draft, but also to the instructional, um, the instructional equity uh, policy. And so the policy provides the value of the direction uh, 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 for, for, for the district. And then we, the next step after we get the policy is to identify the pieces that we need to look at. And I fully expect that curriculum and instruction will be a primary piece. Along with discipline, along with, uh, oh my goodness. I, I mean, I got, I got a list here. Um, because I, I, you know, looking at communication, leadership and administration, curriculum and instruction, um, and uh, so there will be pieces, training, teacher training, uh, opportunities for students to engage and have conversation, be exposed to different uh, 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 kinds of uh, literature. I got that same, I don't know if we're talking about the same person, but I got a call that one of the reading lists from uh, one of the high schools did not have a single person of color or a female on the list. And I don't think none of it's, it's intentional, but it is very impactful. And so um, I, I, I'm excited to see uh, how the superintendent and uh, what those what those steps, those action steps, will look like. Um, but I, I'm already going in with with a um, an idea of kind of what what I would like to see. And I have two grandkids in the school district. I don't have any more kids that are students, but I have two grandbabies. Oh, Marco, this is Ricky Lind. I'm a music Oh, teacher. hey, Ricky, how are you? Hi. Oh, good, thank you. Can I offer something through you to Quentin also on the teacher side? Sure. Thank you. On the teacher side of things, Quentin, it's kind of like doing dishes. Like, oh, as a music <laughs> teacher, I'm like, where did this piece of music come from? I would never do this with my students. So it could be a maintenance side issue too, just uh, working through the teacher and the principal, like, hey, this we're using this in this class and it shouldn't be there. So mm -hmm. could we use something else? So that's yeah. another option you could do is take it to the, the teacher. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, the principal. And I find music too, it, it's I would never use certain pieces with my mm -hmm. students. So it could be taken to the teacher as well. Thank you. That's true. 
That is so true. And that's exactly what we did in my case. We just, you know, I advised the parent to just go talk to the, take it back to the teacher because it was, and it was not an intentional thing. All right. I mean, it, it, it was just, it was just what happened on that day, that time. And it was, it was a, a, a readily and welcomed, uh, it was readily uh, fixed and it was a welcomed response. So, um, so yeah, it can be as simple as that. I often know that, um, well, because I'm speaking from a white perspective, um, that a lot of times racism is, um, I don't see it as often as I probably would if I'm walking with my wife somewhere and she tells me, then I notice it, but I wouldn't notice it otherwise. So a lot of it, a lot of the time, it's not um, apparent to yeah. people that are in power, I mm -hmm. guess. And and that is and you are so and that is so true. And the uh, is a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, we we bring to to our work and our in our engagements. We bring every way, everything that we know and the ways we've been imprinted by whether it's power or privilege or, or hurt and pain and disappointment, we bring that with us. And one of the things I think we can do for, for adults is give them safe ways so that they can at least think about, you know, the impact of what they, of, 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 of how they think and what they bring to the classroom. And uh, uh, because I, I think our teachers are doing a great job. I think I think we can resource them in, in ways that will help them be more culturally responsive and more sensitive. And so how how we will how that will be done, uh, I don't have that piece yet, but I, I know that it will be part of the 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 implementation of these policies. And it is, and it's not, it is not, uh, you know, uh, I think our children of color face microaggressions every day from somewhere. And none of it, and again, it's not intentional, but we've got to know and we've got to be able to say to ourselves, you know, am I doing all I can to make this place a safe, welcoming learning or work environment for all who, for everybody who's here? So it's not about calling people out for bad behavior, although we have processes for that too. Yeah. Uh, but we also have to uh, um, um, facilitate the opportunities for our kids to have discussions about different kinds of literature, uh, making sure that our kids have uh, opportunities to um, understand uh, a, a different perspective other than their own. Uh, they don't have to agree. Uh, but to do so respectfully. And so I'm hoping that um, the impact of the uh, of these policies will not only improve uh, uh, academic achievement, you know, I mean, I look at our goals, our, our number one, the, they're not in any priority order, but one of our goals is reading. Now we know how important reading is, right? If a kid can't read, and we know by third grade, if a kid can't read, then we we then that kid is probably not likely to be. We know they're not. They're going to struggle. All right. We pray that they graduate. We pray that they that you know they stay in school. But we know that they're not going to read. I mean, if they can't read, they're not going to be as successful by the third grade. So if we want kids to read by the third grade, then we've got to put resources into them being able to do that. We've got to put teacher power behind that. We've got to put training. We've got to do what we need to do. Now, I don't know what all that is, but the superintendent and her, her staff will figure that out. And so by 2026, we should, our reading in this, in this district uh, should improve for all of our kids. All right, right for all of our kids from 50% to 80%. And I know I'm over Crystalline, but I see Julianne, had, Julianne has a, a hand up. Yes, so um, actually I moved from being a youth development tutor um, at an elementary school to being the AA. And um, so I come from a little bit different perspective. And I was just wondering, um, because 
um, I was utilized more during the wind time when I need time. And it was so structured for a lot of our students. And I was wondering how much of um, more, I guess, I don't want to say leeway will a um, instructional aid have to be able to bring in culturally relevant stories, um, material during that time to help our students out. I was lucky enough to be able to have a um, principal allow me to do that with some of my win time with mm -hmm. students in the group. Um, and I know that some of it is going to have to be structured for some of our low students, mm -hmm. but to have them constantly being in that type of envir learning environment is one, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. it, it works if you have it equal with other reading and other cultural pieces brought in. And, and that's a great question. Uh, I, my initial thought is, is that if we are being culturally responsive and we make that the expectation and not the exception, then principals will will be able will be empowered to do just what you just uh, mentioned. Uh, within, you know, within, within, you know, we all have a defined day. We have a defined schedule. We have, you know, how, how these policies might adjust that. I don't know. Uh, but we do have a defined school day. We have a defined uh, amount of time that we are with kids and how we utilize it. Uh, the principal is responsible for setting up those schedules. But if we have, if culturally responsiveness is 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 the expectation across the Anchorage School District, then it's to me it should simply take a, a, a suggestion or a um, you know there should be a process by which we could achieve that which you're talking about. Because mm, there's right, a right now it's not it is not you know I, I I know we have culturally responsive standards for the state of Alaska. And I think we have, I, I think our teachers uh, um, are very familiar with them, but I don't know that that every teacher is familiar and that every teacher understands. And, and see that, I think that's the power of policy. It is, it, it sets the tone and the expectation, the level of respect of what's important in our district. And um, what the community told us uh, and this will be my last little, I know I'm over time. I always go over. And what the community told us was reading, math, the successful achievement of all students, equity, uh, addressing disparities in student group achievement and opportunities, access and program uh, uh, underrepresentation in our programs, identifying and eliminating barriers that impede student success, or family access to learning, diverse and culturally responsive schools and workplace, inclusion, and life and career readiness. Um, and there's more on our website, but I just pulled those off because that's what the community is, that's what the community values, and that's what our schools should be reflecting. Ms. Margo, I just have one extra comment to have. Uh, this is Shannon, parent role. Okay. I hope that those comments and suggestions uh, had uh, some feedback from community members that are Alaska Native or American Indian. Uh, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about how many uh, voices might have been present during that. Uh, if not, I feel like there should be another avenue to give more feedback. Yes, that's just yeah, and that and that yeah, and that's true. We are uh, we have split ourselves up, and we are going to all of the advisory groups. We have set two town halls for the city. Uh, the first one will be on the twenty fifth of March. And that would be a noon meeting, just so people can pop in for uh, during their lunch. And then the next one will be on the. Hold up, let me just look real quick. The thirtieth, and that's a six to eight o'clock uh, town hall. 
Now, we have been discussing these policies in our governance committee, which is a public meeting, and we have gotten lots of testimony on them from uh, since, uh, I think, November. Um, but we ha this, but we did not, the policy just moved out of governance. I think it was March 2nd, no, March 9th. Okay, thank you. So I agree, okay. I agree. We need to have more voices. And so we are all doing, um, we're all okay. doing. Okay, uh, I, can we move on to the next topic? We keep. Okay. So um, if I may make a suggestion, I'm mar marking the town hall dates. NAC members, I will move that forward. And it sounded like, uh, Margo, uh, you would mention that April 20th is the conclusion of the uh, feedback. So if everyone wants to um, uh, send um, feedback um, individually or, you know, as, as a board um, for NAC of support, uh, the avenue sounds like it's there. Um, so I'll make sure to list out the dates and, and forward that on to you NAC members. Sure. And if anybody would like a presentation at another group, just if you can let Crystalline know and uh, we will figure out a board member to uh, accommodate you. Thank you. Brianna, thank you. Thank you, thank you Margo. Thank you. Um, I know that took a lot of time. Um, is there a way we can set up a subcommittee to maybe work on um, NAC's, a draft of NAC's thoughts and support of these policies moving forward? Um, and how would we go about that? So I guess it's um, asking the advisory committee if they want, um, I guess it's a motion to have a subcommittee, but you can, I don't know. I really, want, since Margo said they're, they're waiting till April 20th to decide. Mm -hmm, but I think it's input that Kim's talking about. Yeah. And it's up for discussion for you guys. I'm for wondering if you guys want to have like a some committee to like kind of put together our thoughts before our next meeting, which would be before that deadline. And then when when we have our thoughts aligned, have a letter of support that can go to the board for these policies, because I think the intent there is to do lots of good with this. But we also want to have a strong point and a letter of support might be able to give that punch of what we want and envision in these policies. So could I entertain like a motion to create a subcommittee for those that feel very passionate about this um, to work together and then bring it back next month? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward to um, the next item on our agenda, which is the UAA Native um, Student Services. And we have two guests um, in our meeting right now, Quentin and, oh, I just lost, we just lost uh, uh, Paula Jones there, sorry. Hi, Quentin and Paula. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Nice to see you too. And you're in the presence of a lot of good people and streaming live to YouTube. And we are um, happy to hear any updates about uh, the good things you're doing at UAA. So welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have the, the power to, to share my screen. Is that is that okay? Okay, so I'll um, I'll start our screen share, and then in our presentation we'll introduce ourselves a little bit more formally and whatnot. But um, my name is Quentin Simeon. I work for Native Student Services, and um, Paula is our Student Services Coordinator, and we will be doing a quick presentation on our service that we provide at UAA 
Native Student Services and the NET program. Um, got to move some stuff around. Okay, here it is. And present. Everybody see that okay? Does that look good? That presentation mode? Awesome. Okay. So <clears throat> our, our general motto at Native Student Services is fostering wisdom one mind at a time. And um, so my name is Jisiach, uh, it means little bug. My English name is Quentin. I am a Yupik man. I come from the villages of Bethel and Antioch on the Kuskokum River. Um, I moved to Anchorage in 1994. Um, my family, my, my dad's side of the family are the Simeons, the Morgans, and the Peets. And on my mom's side, we are the Hoffmans and the Millers. Um, and my job at UAA is I work for students or young people who attend um, attend school at UAA. And this is Paula. Um, my name is Paula Jones. I'm originally from Queen Hook, Alaska, uh, which is in the southwest Alaska, about 80 five miles away from Bethel. Um, I come from a large family, the Crows and the Joneses. My entire family still resides uh, back home aside from my mom and my daughter. Um, and uh, I work over at UAA as a student services coordinator. I just started that position in August after graduating with my bachelor's uh, in human services in May. Um, and you know, one of my things is uh, building a connection with the students that come through our program. I do a lot of outreach uh, with our students just checking in to make sure that they're doing okay and um, provide a lot of resources for them if they need it. Um, we also have an office manager, Cheryl. Uh, she was born um, in Holy Cross uh, and her, a lot of her family still resides there. Cheryl has actually been the office manager for about 20 years um, over at UAA and is also a graduate um, of UAA. Um, and, uh, you know, her fa father's families are the Turners and uh, her mom's families are the Franks and the Sims. And yeah. And so our, our director is Amber Christensen Fulmer. Um, her grandmother was born in Haycock, which is up in the, the Nome region on, uh, in, in that Norton Sound spot. Um, she's, but she's born here in Anchorage, um, grown three kids, two dogs and four cats. She's got like a whole family going on. Um, her family up in that Nome area, the Nanauks and Swansons. And uh, she's also an adjunct professor besides being our director. Um, and then her things that she does primarily is it's a student support advocacy and mentorship all across the board. Um, not only student mentorship, but mentorship for both Paul and I and and Cheryl on our um, progression. And so this is our, our mission statement for, for Native Student Services. I'll just kind of talk about the highlights, but we provide support services for all of our primarily rural students, but all Alaska Native, Native American students, or any students who wants to have a space at NSS, um, we just try to have, bring a sense of belonging and having a strong collaborative partnerships across the board, even with other departments, not even at UAA, um, working with UAF and UAS, their rural student services and native student, native student and rural ser student services at, at UAS. Um, so we try to be very inclusive. So uh, what is the NET program? Uh, the NET program stands for Native Early Transition Program. Um, it is meant to serve both rural and urban Alaska Native students who are attending and registered um, at UAA um, in really learning and guiding them uh, on their way to uh, being a successful college student. Um, you know, we really look at um, our model as a whole person standard. Uh, so when students come in, we look at them as that whole person. Um, the NET program now, it has been rebooted and revamped uh, when our director came in uh, last January. 
Um, it was at first a, a five day orientation um, uh, and she turned it into a two year full cohort model uh, and it's based on holistic advising and support through the first two years, which is about 60 credits for a full time student attending UAA. Uh, and we do a lot of strength based uh, student focused support. Um, and as Quentin mentioned earlier, a lot of mentorship um, with them. Uh, the way that the NET program is set up right now um, are in sequential courses. So the first uh, semester usually starts in the fall. Uh, we offer a three credit course um, focused on transitioning into post-secondary college and establishing a sense of belonging and connection and cultural identity project. Now, I will say with that when we first developed the program, uh, we had, um, you know, figured that when the students came in, we would work with them um, on and, you know, have them do a, a, an e-portfolio, essentially highlighting their journey as a college student. And we quickly found out that the students that came into our program, into the NET class, were very underprepared um, to be in college. And so instead of having students conform to our curriculum and, our, and, and the way that we structured the class, we conformed to our students and we met our students where they were at. And so we, we looked at the program and um, realized that we needed to focus on some of the, um, the basics uh, of coming into college. Um, in the second semester, uh, we offer one to three credit course um, focused on mentorship. Uh, and again, the cultural identity project and career pathways. Um, so there is a lot of of the whole person standard, there's a lot of um, meeting with peers and, and having staff and faculty um, that look like you. As you guys saw in our introductions, we show uh, where we come from in Alaska and we talk about our family so that our students can get a really good understanding that we also understand where they are coming from and what they are experiencing in their first semester in post-secondary education. So in the first um, experience that the students have coming into to Anchorage or to um, UAA or any of our, our large campuses can be super daunting, super scary. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot to chew on when your campus can be as big or bigger than some of our rural communities that we have um, in, in remote parts of Alaska. And so um, students are able to move in one week early uh, during this week, we're hoping to have um, some time for them to meet either virtually or in person, um, and build rapport with other students, get them connected to other villages like the financial aid village or the first year advising village or um, disability support services village or Alaska Native Studies village or the residence life village. And just so that they are, they know who their people are at before the big hustle and bustle of the first semester comes in. Um, we try to have engaged campus tours or would make it very real and accessible for the students. Um, if that's to be done on video or an actual walking tour with students. Um, and also getting students connected to UA Online, Blackboard, um, some of the technology that we use for student success on campus. Um, personal transitional advising, just getting to know who our students are and what their needs are going to actually be throughout the semester. If they don't have any family who's going to be here, there's a little bit more engagement, I think, um, on our part when they when they do have family in town. Um, and then we have presentations from the other departments, from the Chamai Room, ANROP, um, Indigenous and other outreach programs across the campus. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we definitely uh, look at the whole person, right? So we do everything with a holistic approach um, and we find it really important to be rooted in indigenous philosophies, beliefs, and practices. What we want our students to know is that they don't have to leave their culture and identity behind once they enter into this, uh, onto campus life and in this institution. We want them to come in and, and go on a journey 
and learn how to navigate through the through the university system as native students and using their indigenous knowledge for the uh, for their benefit in the classrooms. Um, and so, you know, we a lot of the things that we do in the whole person standard is we focus on on their needs, you know, their intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, physical, and and everything else needs, their basic needs. Because once, um, if they're not doing okay in those things, they are gonna have a very hard time succeeding with their education. So a lot of what I do and our instructor as well, you know, we have a um, behavioral health background is we are continually outreaching to our students on a regular basis to make sure that they are connected to make sure that they are staying engaged and to make sure that they are feeling healthy emotionally and, and mentally. Because a lot of times, you know, within the first maybe month and a half, six weeks after uh, the first semester starts, a lot of students start getting homesick and, you know, missing their peers and ha are having a really hard time connecting with a space or uh, with staff and peers on campus because there is no one that really seems to understand where they are coming from. So we definitely do a lot of work on community building from the moment they enter into campus for that um, net week orientation. Uh, so our first our first goal is to make sure that they are doing okay and then we start focusing on the academics. And I think um, a lot a lot of our students experience like some sort of a almost a sense of trauma when they get here. And so being able to like you can breathe now, you can you can have this space and it's safe. I think it's one of the things that we do at Data Student Services, give that, that place of safety. So as you can see here, I just wanted to put a visual in it um, that, you know, all these things such as uh, mental health needs, career planning, uh, financial health, meeting the basic needs and tutoring, um, you know, it's it's kind of all over the place, right? You have all these different things that you need to do. Um, and nothing kind of makes sense and you're going and you're bouncing back between things and you kind of lose track and you end up slipping through the cracks. So instead of doing things so separately like this, we work at the holistic approach, which is in the next slide, so that we are really forming an individualized plan with each student, um, which is so important, building that connection with each student on a different level, because we are then more able to understand what it is that they need, what they may be struggling with, what they are excelling in, um, so that we can really foster and, and, and support um, their vision for themselves. And so, you know, what we really want is students to understand that Native Student Services as a whole is, is the hub, right? So they may need financial aid, they may need to, um, talk to an advisor, but they may not know where to start because there are so many different departments. There are so many different titles. Um, we really want them to know that if any time that they need something, that they can always know that they can go to Native Student Services with one of four of us and say, hey, I need this and we will connect them with that right person. And we're hoping that by that point, you know, we have built enough of a rapport and trust with our students that they are willing to engage with other people that we bring into our space, such as advisors and, and professors even, um, because sometimes it is pretty intimidating to talk to complete strangers uh, uh, about your struggles and um, you know even advocating for yourself. We work a lot with students on building in those competencies and also um, speaking with other departments and staff on you know things such as cultural awareness and cultural relevancy and sensitivity and learning how to engage successfully with Native students, especially those that are coming in from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we also try to do is um, provide the best avenue for success for our students once they come out of uh, their elementary and their secondary uh, schooling experience. Um, once students kind of break free or get out of, of that high school experience that's kind of when life really begins and so if you imagine your your higher education as as a tree um, if you get your aas or your aa degree that's kind of like along the trunk the main part of your education 
And so that's kind of broken down in a couple of tiers in higher education terms. Um, tier one being writing, math, and oral communications. And so that's the, the foundational um, classes that our students need to be successful, no matter where they go. If they take an AAS degree or an associate's um, general um, education, Associate of Arts degree, or if they branch off into one of the bachelor degrees, they need that those tier ones at the beginning of their journey before they take any other classes. And then tier two are going to be the rounding out or the rest of the trunk of that tree. And that's going to be getting students closer to their AA um, and then eventually to the branches of their bachelor degree. Um, and of course, we have five themes for our GER, general education requirements. That's um, Alaskan themed GER. And that can also be within the arts, humanities, natural sciences, or even the social sciences. So a lot of different options on how to get in these classes, but just making sure that the students are taking them in the proper order. Um, because I think almost every student that enters the higher education environment they come to come to us as a non-degree seeking student basically um, they might have an idea of where they want to go but college is such a broad experience for people to have um, these opportunities for growth that we don't want to limit them in what classes they want to take but want to make sure that they're taking the right ones so no matter what branch that they want to go down that they're properly equipped um, from the get-go so you don't end up taking your math class in your final semester that's going to be like your one thing that you need to graduate and so um, we want to make sure that our students are doing things in, in a proper, in a proper and fashion. Can, can I just add um, yeah. uh, we recently um, met with the writing department as we know you know writing and math are are some of the challenge areas that a lot of students face um, and so we recently met with the writing department and we told them these things and some of them understood where we were coming from and um, in working out those details we formed a, a partnership that uh, the writing professors are now going to be we now have a, a, a writing professor specific for our net class. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we really worked on tra slowly transitioning the students into post-secondary education so that they're so not so overwhelmed. And, you know, we're teaching them those basics of um, UA online. We're teaching them how to navigate Blackboard. We're teaching them some terminology that they're gonna hear from professors and, and um, other students. And so, in conjunction with that, we the writing department is going to do a late start with us. So we have two weeks to work with these students transitioning slowly into the college life. And then the writing department will come in and start um, teaching their classes in the writing department, um, providing students enough space and, and time. And they also develop a, a writing lab. Um, that is also a credit um, that will be offered for our students as well. And we're hoping that we can get um, other departments on board, such as math, because math is one of the biggest, biggest issues that we, we have um, in, in students' uh, struggles with overcoming which math class that they're going to go through or even passing by math because it is so fast-paced. So we, we are working on some things. So the, the program is called uh, Accelerated Learning Program. And uh, it's, it's a model where you have your general class and then a support class kind of built on top of that where you have that extra um, extra support right afterwards. And so instead of students having to take two or three years of um, pre-GER classes, like taking, you know, writing 090, writing 110, then writing 111, what, what the students are now able to do is if they test close to like a writing 111, they can take the writing 111 and then take that support class right on top of it. And so um, that reduces semester long worth of, of education and a $700, $750 class. So reducing the amount of tuition that our students are paying, condensing some of the time that they're going to be in school, providing them with that little bit of extra support because we know they can do the work. They just need that little bit of extra because they're 
coming to Anchorage is shocking. It's uh, coming to college is shocking. So we just provide that buffer for our students. And so some of the things we do in our space to provide some of that uh, buffering um, is we have 10 computers uh, stations. We have a printing station so that students can print out some of their work. Um, we have a communal study space and quiet study spaces that students can go into for more quiet things, provide tutoring. Um, and that's one of the things that we have a strong partnership with the Learning Commons is providing tutoring for some of our harder classes and direct tutors that work directly with our programs and our students. And so that it is that this is your community kind of support. Um, we also have visiting area for, with couches. Kids will fall asleep on there and we just let them sleep, cover them with blanket. Um, we have a student fridge so students can bring in their, their lunch, especially if they're commuting a long ways and they don't can't get back and forth to their, their homes. Um, and we have an open pantry that's open all the time that has all kinds of snacks in it for our students. Um, so I wanted to jump in. I know that I'm watching the time uh, and we do okay. end at eight o'clock. Um, more importantly, the reason why um, uh, we have uh, the net program here for UAA is uh, just due to COVID, I have a concern that students may not be pursuing higher education this year, or maybe they didn't make plans or fill out the FAFSA, um, which they still can. Um, and we wanted to make sure that our students who are staying local have the connection with universities or whatever program. So the next question is, how do they get a hold of you? Can they call you up soon? Can they call you? Can they start talking to you now? How, are you able? Do they have to be graduated to be talking to you? So, how can people get a hold of you? Great, great question. So, on on the screen that's up right now is our email addresses. That's the best way to get a hold of us. Um, I think Paula and I can put our our emails in the in the chat box as well. I don't know if I can cut and paste from this, I don't think so. Um, but that's that's the way to get a hold of us. Our general line, I'll put that in the chat too. I'm gonna stop the share, so. Um, oh, q and A. I guess I'll put it in the, in the q and A. Is that where I put stuff? Do I put well, stuff one thing that we can do is, um, since we're streaming on YouTube, I can share this YouTube video on our Facebook page and, okay. and share out your emails as well. Um, and they can always go on to uh, UAA website and look up UAA Native Student Services and all of our information pops up on there, along with the registration form um, for, for NET class if they're interested in joining our NET program. But we are uh, definitely available. We are we really want to connect with our students. We definitely want to connect with students who are interested in going to college so that, um, you know, the earlier we connect with them and familiarize them with our faces and our space. And um, I, I really feel like that the idea of going to college won't be so daunting um, because by then they will be comfortable enough to approach us with any questions or concerns that they may have. And, uh, they'll be, you know, uh, we can introduce them to other people as well within the other departments that they need uh, to work on their FAFSA and residence life and, and things of that nature. So they can, they are absolutely welcome to to call us. And and we want parents and, and family to be involved as well. They are a part of our community. And mm -hmm. so if we can get parents engaged with us as well and get comfortable with us, um, I really de definitely think that we can make some progress with getting students on board with going to UAA in the fall. Well, Guyana, thank you so much. And, um, you know, hoping to point students in your direction and we'll make sure to share away um, your information. So thank you so much for being here. Guyana, for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so we only have a few uh, more pieces of information for you from Title VI that we wanted to make sure to share out um, before the conclusion of the meeting. I'm looking at the time and we do have uh, 15 minutes remaining and our part will be, um, at least my part will be pretty short. So hopefully you, should, you are able to um, see my screen. I wanted to quickly give you an update on the current status of our financial report and then our, uh, most importantly, our easy grant part one uh, that was submitted on behalf of Title VI for the grant. And then Cheryl will conclude with all the good stuff and that is the cultural programming um, and upcoming opportunities. Um, so our financial report was sent out to you, NAC members. Uh, we do have some uh, budget codes cleanup that we have to um, take care of, but overall, all in all, so good. And uh, we are, you know, budgeting for a summer camp um, or a summer enrichment program that um, Cheryl will be talking about, as well as other opportunities. So everything looks good, and we'll be working on the budget for next year uh, for your approval on April. Um, 15, I believe, is the date of approval for the next year's grant. Um, um, you'll see red, but there's things that are not going to be red the next time we meet, and that is just due to some cleanup. Um, so the more important update that we have for you is that um, Doreen and I have worked on uh, the um, uh, electronic administration of the grant. Uh, to submit our numbers to the Office of Indian Education for next year. And that grant deadline um, uh, we completed, and that was on March 11. And we did, due to um, uh, enrollment numbers, have a decrease in our 506 forms. So those numbers are there. You could see 2019-2020, um, we had a count of um, 7,233 people in um, our program. And then this year uh, for the maximum for enrollment, we have um, 6,423 students that we reported to the federal government. Uh, we are formula funded. So um, we are awaiting their feedback on um, that will be giving us a number um, after the second part of the grant is submit submitted. Um, Fortunately, the, um, there are opportunities for discretionary grants um, that our Native and Tribal communities will be amping up for awards. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot more um, um, grants and programs in the community for our Native students. We shall keep you posted. And leaving on a good note, I want to make sure that Cheryl Sherman is able to quickly update um, you all on our cultural programming and what is upcoming. Hello, everyone. I will be super fast. I just wanted to show you guys what I wasn't able to show you since I was doing this the last meeting. So uh, in the top row is two of the soapstone carvings that our middle school students did. And then the bottom row is two of the high school students. And then this is our, what we're looking forward to slide. So on the top row, you can see the process of us preparing for moose antler scrimshaw. So on the left is the antler and then it being cut up um, by our artist and then on the right is a little glimpse at what will be being mailed out to high school students. This really, it'll, they're going out tomorrow um, to those that have already signed up. And there is still a little bit of space. So if over the weekend when I'm hoping to get some more people signed up, then I'll go ahead and get those mailed out on Monday. And then on the bottom is our save the date for our summer enrichment program. I'm super excited. Uh, and that will be going out to families. It was sent, there was a electronic version sent out, but we're actually gonna be mailing postcards for families to stick up on their fridge as well. And this is the format of the postcard. And many of you know, you probably know Vincent Gregory. He is our carver who has been, uh, he shared uh, the soapstone carving 
talent with students. And then he also shared the little ones, the soap carving, and it, that was really fun and messy. Um, so really looking forward to the seeing what the outcomes of the talents of students with the moose antlers. And it was really great to be able to see that students are making that connection with him. He actually had a student who did soap carving and then came in with their parents to the shop. So he um, he carves at the Alaska Art Alliance and a family actually went and looked at what they have displayed there to go see the ivory snow goggles that Vincent made. And then over um, over Ferrandi's spring break, they had a booth at the Diamond Center and he actually had another one of the students stop by and say hi to him there too. So that was great. And then we're getting ready to do things in person. So our beating circle is slowly moving to in person at certain locations. Um, and we've been doing some string games with students. We're getting ready to do felt button blankets again. Students at West have been continuing to make more baskets. They've been making the, uh, the tiny drums that were really popular and they're going to be making uh, big instrumental drums as well. We've got um, in those beating circles at the high schools, we're starting with different beating techniques, but also inviting like students if they're working on projects to bring those if they think they might want to do something with their graduation cap if they're not really sure what um, I'm going to kind of help assist with that as well. I meant to put the picture of the in process cap for my niece um, up, but I will have to share that with you guys and hopefully it'll be completed for the next meeting so you guys can see that. And then we're plowing forward with SEP, our summer enrichment program. And this year's theme is nurturing nature, stewarding our land. So we're gonna be outside a lot, looking at what's around us, how, what our relationship is to that, and doing some really great things with that as well. Well, Goyana, and um, since we had so much content for this session, NAC members will be sharing uh, this presentation with you so you can refer back to it. Uh, the best way to find out about Cheryl's um, programs would be on our website or on our Facebook page. Um, so oftentimes she will target market um, high school students for a high school event, right? Um, but if you're curious about everything hap that's happening overall, you can visit our ASD department website. Um, as well as our Facebook page. Um, every day we pretty much post something new. So thank you for sharing such exciting information. Um, so we do have seven minutes um, and um, I just wanna kind of open it up if there's uh, other points of clarification, questions, uh, next steps, um, a lot of follow-up communication, it sounds um, between now and the next session. Thank you, Crystal and could I go with our NIEA topics? Thank you. We attended uh, the National Indian Ed Association annual Hill Day, which is usually in Washington, D.C., but it was virtual this year. And in attendance, um, scheduled in our meeting uh, with Don Young's staff was Winter Marshall Allen from Homer. She teaches special ed down there. Uh, Christy McEwen, who teaches music in Fairbanks. Uh, Crystal and Scott, who's in our Zoom. Thank you, Crystal. And uh, Karen Dillon, who teaches I think secondary math in Fairbanks, I forget. A gifted and talented in Fairbanks is what she does. Uh, myself, who teaches music here in Anchorage, and Sonia Scan, who is a school board member in Ketchikan. And there is also uh, members in our meeting who are from, do you remember which village they were in, Crystalline? Oh, they were from the Hooper Bay Charter School. Right, that's so a new charter school for them. And they're super excited to share that news with us. Uh, but we we had scheduled meeting with Don Young's staff uh, who actually did not show. So we had them record our session. We we're able to talk about nine out of 10 topics. We we're only given 30 minutes. And in those topics uh, we are given from the National Indian Ed Association, we personalized them to fit Alaska. Uh, the first one would be policy work 
and culturally sustaining and culturally competent language in our laws. Financial asks from the handouts, which were covered by me, including fully funding, which I handed off the mic to Crystalline for, for Title VI. Infrastructure allocations, meaning road and ferry systems, covered by Winter and Sonia. Uh, broadband access uh, for internet all across Alaska. The Higher Ed Act re reauthorization, uh, which was covered by Karen and Christy. It's also known as Executive Order 13592. Diverse Educator Recruitment and Retention, which was covered by Winter, because we both serve on the Teachers Union Ed Diversity Collective. Immersion Schools Increased Funding for the Esther Martinez Act. They're asking for $2 million as an increase. Uh, language Preservation to Address Impact of COVID-19, particularly in Lower 48, uh, where they're suffering this extreme loss of community elders. And also the last thing in Charter Schools, as um, in, was it Hooper Bay? Sorry short-term memory loss. Yes, Hooper Bay. Okay, yes, okay. <laughs> so that's what we covered. And um, the net, the Teachers Union Ed Diversity Collective, which Winter and I um, serve on to help recruit and retain diverse educators, they're really holding my feet to the fire. And they're having me do a presentation and I called it uh, what I wish I knew before I started teaching. And I sent um, Doreen and Crystal an invite to this Zoom. It's open for current veteran and aspiring educators. And I cover everything from class management to retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? NEC members? Points of conversation, clarification. Ricky, thank you for being a part of that. And Crystal, and also um, having a voice really does make a difference. Crystal, can I share? Absolutely. Okay. You guys are going to be so amazed. Um, I'm so, I'm so proud. I just, um, two, lots of things to be proud of tonight. And all of you are part of this huge endeavor that actually probably took, I think it was four years. So dun, dun, dun. The book is done. It's hard covered. It's done. We love it. So this is going to be in the hands of third, third graders. It, the pilot, uh, I think it's done now. We did a pilot in a different couple different schools. Brian, your school was one of them. Um, so this is the book. It's gorgeous. It's, it's forever. It's going to be not forever, I hope, but, um, it's timeless. I will tell you, at least we, we think it's timeless. An amazing job. One of the key, the features that I like, of course, is the little, um, the square, fact factoids i guess or rectangular and then i love the what we did with the pictures because we did um really like traditional old um old pictures and then we also featured making sure that we have our native people that you know of today so you'll see both it's pretty amazing the stories are um amazing as well and lots of great, again, it's it's nice to look at, it's nice to touch and feel. And then I just wanna let you know that everybody's name is in here. We have an um, acknowledgement page. And so we put you guys on there, Native Advisory Committee, Nache, Angela, Shannon, Tanya, Luke, Ricky, Shanda, Brian, Kim, and Megan. So thank you for all your hard work. We also recognize some other cultural consultants as well. So you guys all put a lot of work into this. Thank you for um, your assistance on this. It's going to be amazing. Uh, it's already amazing. Again, we're finishing up the pilot. We're finishing up the um, editing the teacher's manual. And so everything will be out and about. We're actually, I think Crystalyn's helping us with a party, an epic party is what Dr. Bishop would say. So, um, I think I, I shed tears when I looked through it because I was so happy and so pleased. Um, and so thank you, all of you, for all your hard work today. Um, it's another day to walk with pride. Um, you guys are doing it. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my, of my heart. It's another, you know, another dream of mine that's fulfilled. Um, Yupik Immersion was one. Um, third grade curriculum, I'd like to see ninth grade done as well. 
So, and of course, regalia. So I've had these really significant um, journeys and um, Native Advisory has always been a part of that. So you guys are strong and have our, have our students and our community in your hearts. And I appreciate that. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Can we, can we find that at a bookstore? Can we buy those? Not yet. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have a party and you guys will get a copy as well. So just to let you know, we just made the whole list of who needs to get one. So there'll be, I think we're going to mail them or give them out at the party. Um, but if we do sell them, because I think everybody in Alaska is going to want something like, even if you came and visited the state, I think you'd be interested in that. Um, I'd like to sell them. And what I, what I asked to do is that the monies be set aside so kids could go to the Heritage Center. Third graders could go to the Heritage Center. That would be my desire. So um, we're, we're looking at that. So Dr. Bishop is um, certainly committed to selling. I think we've already got a lot of requests kind of across the state because they'd like to be able to pick it up and just use it because it's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal um, curriculum. So it's great. And of course, it stars a bunch of great people, our native people. So it has to be great. And of course, it's great. <laughs> so more to come. Can we get another like sidebar meeting to whoever wants to be a part of it? Hopefully, Doreen will about Margot's information. I want to hear uh, your thoughts, Doreen. We're running out of time, but. So are you motioning to make a subcommittee? Mm, I don't know if I want a subcommittee. It's just a sidebar meeting. You motion it. Okay, Shannon motions to make a subcommittee in regards to uh, the equity and anti-racism, equity in education and anti-racism policies for ASD guardrails and goals. Thanks for completing that motion. <laughs> Is there a second? This is Georgiana. I second. So a motion has been made to make a Senate committee about the instructional equity and anti-racism policies for the guardrails and goals for ASD um, to flush that out before the next meeting um, and explore that more. Is there any discussion? Um, is there a possibility to put that discussion with the um, the resolution graduation regalia discussion or should it be separated? I think it should be separated just because regalia is so big and their policies are another big thing. Um, I think there's a lot of overlapping, but I don't think it should be joined. Seeing no more discussion, um, all those in favor of this motion of creating the subcommittee, please vote now. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Advisory vote. It passes with the majority, so we will um, have um, Chris Lynn help. Um, organize that subcommittee and anybody that's interested, please let her know. Um, uh, looking at the time, is there any other discussions um, there? Seeing and hearing none, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting of the NAC. Oh, I'll entertain the motion, Kim. I'll second. I'll second it. Any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, we shall adjourn this meeting um, on March 15, 2021 of the 
and AC November 6th at 8.04 p.m. Who second the motion? Was that Brent. was me, Tanya. Oh, thank never you. Mind. <laughs> Just throwing any name out there. <laughs> I, that's okay, Ricky. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought it was Georgiana.